the curse of sin is broken there's a reason why the darkness runs from the light there's a reason why we stand in now forgiven jesus is alive Dear Father, it often seems to us that in this world, death rules. Out of the blue, at random, the attacker comes to pick us off. We hide in our houses and hope for a cure, but we know that sooner or later we will all get sick, we'll die, and our bodies will turn to ash and dust. And so we have reason to despair. But this world also gives incontestable evidence of your rule. When Jesus lived with us, you proved that he was your son with massive power. He made barrels of wine from buckets of water, calm seas from wild gales. He brought clear sight out of dark eyes. He made healthy children from limp corpses. His astonishing miracles left us in no doubt that he had your approval. 
People thought that death could be used to control him, but we didn't realise that it was you who let us nail him up and kill him. We mistakenly thought that death had a firm grip on him, but we were wrong. It was impossible for pain and decay to hold him down. You lifted him up, gave him unending life. You restored his complete power and rightful authority. And so we have reason to hope. We thank you that Jesus' resurrection is the first, but far from the last, that as he slipped easily out of the grip of death, so will we, that as he escaped pain and decay, so will we, that as he sits with you in heaven, so will we. Please forgive us. Please let the Holy Spirit build us up. Give us hope in the resurrection to life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are two Bible readings for today. The first Bible reading is from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 8. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 to 57. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Happy Easter. The sun came up, the women went to the tomb. The tomb was empty, and hope began to spread throughout the world. Uh, from a tiny event in Palestine 2000 years ago, person after person, country after country, region after region, until millions and millions of people around the world share in the hope of the resurrection of Jesus. And because it's a real hope, and because the real risen Lord Jesus gives it, this hope is able to continue to touch people all around the world, uh, every person, regardless of class and race and uh, gender, uh, and every people of every kind as it spreads throughout the world. Uh, wouldn't it be great to imagine this Easter a pandemic, not of illness, but of hope, of resurrection hope, and to imagine not field hospitals, but field hospitals of hope which is actually what I'd like you brothers and sisters to be, little field hospitals of Christian hope in a troubled world. We'll come back to that in a little while. But while we're talking about hospitals, it strikes me that hospitals are very much on everyone's mind at the moment, though a little out of most people's sight. I've never spent that much time in hospitals myself. I certainly don't know what it's like to be a doctor, let alone a doctor overwhelmed in a busy ward. 
Uh, I've always sort of been on the bleeding side of the medical equation myself. I failed science at school. Uh, I always make a cuppa when there's a surgical show on TV. In fact, I'd rather do the washing up than watch it. So I have absolutely no medical qualifications whatsoever. I did watch a lot of MASH as a kid though. Uh, you may not be old enough to remember MASH, uh, but MASH, that's um, Mobile Army Surgical Hospital, um, was a long-running TV comedy show from the US set in Korea during the Korean War. Uh, and, um, you know, it's a comedy uh, because war can get a little over serious at times and it's one of the great comedies, I think, one of the great TV shows. And the central character was a doctor named Henry Pierce, or better known as Hawkeye, the perfect, funny, world-weary, clear-sighted, brilliant doctor. Amazing with one-liners, um, conversations with colleagues like, Pierce, are you scared? Don't be silly, I'm too frightened to be scared. Well, his lines always were like surgically precise. Uh, in one episode, he writes home to his family and he writes this. He says, Korea's pretty much the same story. The fighting goes on, the hatred, the violence, the senseless brutality, men behaving like animals. And then there's the war. Or medical summaries for patients like, for your condition, you're in a great condition. The, the most tender thing, therefore, that could ever happen in a MASH episode is that when this brilliant, funny man who seems to be able to overwhelm moments of tragedy with light relief stops and is in himself just overwhelmed by the arrival of injured and sick bodies. And in one episode, really exhausted, he just sits down and there's not a joke in sight. And he says, they'll keep coming whether I'm here or not. Trapper went home and they're still coming. Henry got killed and they're still coming. Wherever they come from, they'll never run out. They'll never run out. And he turns to his friend and says, Frank, do you know what a hero is? 99 times out of 100, he's somebody who's tired enough and cold enough and hungry enough to not give a damn. I don't give a damn. Even heroes get overwhelmed. Being overwhelmed is a primary trigger for stress in animals. I said this a few weeks ago. Uh, events that are overwhelming, um, uncontrollable and unpredictable are overwhelming. They're, they're too much. And even the name pandemic registers this. An epidemic just means it's sort of around the people, um, epi the people. A pandemic, pan means everyone. It's for all of the people everywhere. That's overwhelming, isn't it? And that's just what a pandemic is. That's why we're all in it together, so do your bit. But Hawkeye was a reminder of an even greater pandemic, something greater than war, greater even than global illness. Uh, he was a reminder of what Kanishka Rafael, another preacher in Sydney, reminded me of this week. He, he called it out, he named it, the death pandemic. It's a little bit shocking, isn't it? But Christians insist that death is not a natural part of our world. It's not always been there and was not intended to be there. No, death is a bitter fruit of our first parents and our own deeds in rejecting God and life. As overwhelming as that thought is, we remember today with rejoicing that a greater power actually comes and overwhelms it. It remedies the ultimate pandemic and to a war-weary world, it brings news of victory. Uh, today we begin with what's on the page and then we turn our eyes to see what's around us everywhere in the field. But first the page. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter that we read and addressed it to the Corinthians. Uh, Corinth was a big, flashy, trashy seaside city, um, and it contained some Christians happily. Uh, among these Christians were some smaller subset of Christians who amazingly believed that they had already been resurrected from the dead. Um, that is, not that they died and come back to life, but that what Jesus had begun in them was so strong that death would never overwhelm them. They would literally never die. Uh, I suspect they worked out eventually that they were wrong sooner or later. Um, and we learn from this that sort of puffed up proud Christians have always existed. They're not just a modern phenomenon. 
But it wasn't just the Christians, like city, like citizen, because Corinth was its own pumped up, arrogant, trashy, flashy town. Uh, if you live in Maroubra, like we do, you know a thing or two about Greek columns. Uh, a lot of the old Maroubra homes have Greek columns. And you'll know that there are a variety from the kind of austere, kind of Athenian column uh, to the slightly more embellished Doric column. Uh, but if you really want a column, you went for a Corinthian column. They're like in ornately fluted and they've got, you know, flashy bits on top and then they've got flashy bits on their flashy bits. They were ancient bling. And they really spelt out the character of the city and the character of the people in it. Uh, like city, like citizen. And uh, frankly, that's kind of a bit true for us. It seems to me there are a few of us in Maroubra beholding the eternal invincibility of our abs. And what Paul would say to us is that's just, you know, I guess firstly he'd admire, but then he'd say that's obviously foolish. Uh, the whole passage, the, the page really begins with verse 50, which says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood, no matter how good it is, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. That is, even at our best, our bodies are perishing. And uh, we have a real problem. We are not on a trajectory for life with God at this point. And, and Paul says the great news of the resurrection is it's not pretty poetry. It's not a metaphor. It's not a symbol. It's not an idea. It was a fact. A man came from the dead with the ability to give life to others. And that truth means that these perishable bodies might yet be overcome by life. Paul uses two images to spell it out, clothing and consuming. Firstly, clothing. Uh, the truth is that people put their trust and hope in Jesus. Their, um, their failing flesh, you know, crumpled and wrinkled like my old chinos, will not merely fade and crumple, but will be overclothed by the greater clothes of Jesus' resurrection says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We'll not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. And Jesus' resurrection here, not fancy poetry, not just an idea, but will actually redeem our dying flesh by overclothing it with life. We'll be dressed not by death, but by Jesus so if you feel the frailty of your flesh today, and frankly, which of us doesn't, then isn't it a rather, rather great news to hear that um, our flesh that frays like a favourite coat that has seen better days can actually be replaced with something greater or, or revived even better by a greater power? Better clothing in resurrection. Consuming. Secondly, Paul uses the, the, the image of consuming. Paul gets really excited when he starts talking about this because the great threat of death has been consumed by a greater victory. It's been swallowed up. That's the word Paul uses, swallowed up. You know, death has been gobbled up by life in his mind. Now, there's a great scene uh, in the um, otherwise pretty average Star Wars movie, The Phantom Menace. Uh, it's a scene where the heroes kind of go underwater in order to get into another particular planet and uh, kingdom and underwater in their starship turned submarine. I told you it wasn't a very good Star Wars movie. Uh, they are attacked by like a giant sea creature. And just as it opens its mouth to gobble them up and your heart stops, because even though it's a bit silly, you know, it's big. Another greater sea creature comes up and swallows that one. And your heart, you know, kind of has a moment of pause before that sea creature turns on your heroes again and your heart stops and an even greater sea creature comes out and gobbles up that sea creature and your heart, of course, is again at pause. It's a silly movie, you know, it's kind of enjoyable but, but dumb. But it, it makes the point the greater will always consume the lesser. That's just the law of the sea, the law of life. It's the way it is. The more powerful will always overpower the less powerful and the great news here is that there is such a power that death gets swallowed up in victory so paul writes where O death is your victory where O death is your sting 
Uh, death is led around by Jesus like a toothless tiger. It's kind of poked at like a flamed out dragon. It's a thing without sting. Death, that's the power of Jesus. And the amazing thing is this victory becomes our victory. It wasn't even our victory. It was Jesus' victory. We were dying in droves and still are. And it was he who got out of the tomb, but having already taken from us the pains which we gave him, which put him in the tomb, he comes out and gives us the victory. What an amazing page of scripture. Well, what's it look like in the field? Well, let us just stop now and drink in the delights of this victory. How does it change us today? What's happening by God's hand around us now? Well, the first thing we see is that we're not yet in the seat of victory. The Corinthians were wrong. Our resurrection has not yet come. Uh, People are dying and will die, and Christians are and will be among them. Jesus' resurrection power has begun in us, but it's not carried us through the gates of death and out the other side yet. We have dark valleys yet to walk in. We have seasons of pain, failing flesh, coughs that may well get worse. We're capable of actually dying, aren't we? And we will. So we're clearly not in the seat of victory yet. The Corinthians were wrong. Resurrection is not that cheap a truth. And if you treat the resurrection like the Corinthians did, it will make you shallow, loveless and useless. It'll make you march around with Jesus' victory like a tin pot general. It'll make foolish pastors call their flocks together with no love for their flocks and no love for their neighbours. As if death were something uh, we could merely skip over rather than we have to pass through to resurrection. What a silly idea. It will make Christians unable to properly grieve lost people. And it will make Christians arrogant over their neighbours. You'll cheapen the victory and act as if it was won without tears. So the first thing we see is, for all the greatness of this victory, we're yet not in all the greatness of it. But we will be. And the news that this victory is not only coming but is certain, changes everything and enables us in the middle of this battle to be like little field hospitals of hope. And I can think of three ways with which we finish. Uh, The first thing that the resurrection is able to give us is victory over despair. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen the charts. We've all been reading charts. In fact, I saw a great chart with a curve that went like that which was the chart of the incident of reading charts. Uh, I have my own chart, of course, here, which um, recalls the two major ones I saw, which is the rise in, um, in food hoarding, uh, which is followed about a week, week and a half later, of course, by this, the hoarding of booze. Um, this is a sign of something, and uh, it's not of mere survival. It's a sign that we're living like pagans. In the same chapter that Paul talks about the resurrection, he quotes an ancient Greek philosopher. And Paul says, if there's no, no resurrection, then, quote the philosopher, today we eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And it's just a sign that some eating and drinking is not just about sustaining life, but is actually a mask for despair. Um, and uh, a sign that actually a really hard time is not just a hard time, but to be without these things, that really is deprivation. Uh, And to imagine Australia without a richness of these things is to imagine us in apparently a hard time. Uh, This is a very privileged and yet very desperate place to be in. Uh, I have a friend who works at the checkout at Dan Murphy's on the day before uh, it was thought it was going to be closed permanently had customers arriving, um, pleading that they wouldn't close. Um, uh, People who suffer the disease of alcoholism with tears in their eyes saying, it can't close, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, But you don't need to be an alcoholic to know the despair of alcohol. 
You just need to use alcohol to make the day better instead of God. Uh, I don't know about you, but I think that's a real present danger in these times, and the chart bears it out. And I want to say like city, like citizen, but should not be like Christian. And I'd like you to do a little check on yourself, and I'd like you to count whether the number of bottles of wine you possess outnumber the number of times in the last week you got on your knees in prayer. And if it is greater, then genuinely ask yourself the question of who you're turning to in your need and whether you have the divine on your side or really just despair, well masked. But we don't need to be like this. It doesn't need to be like city, like citizen. We're Christians. And the resurrection gives us victory over despair and we can be little field hospitals of hope. The second thing it gives victory, us a victory over is meaninglessness. Meaninglessness. Resurrection can overwhelm meaninglessness. Uh, I have teenage kids. This is not the year to be a teenage kid. Uh, this year they've had their birthdays robbed, their graduations, their parties, the joy of being able to drive a car, even their early experiments with nostalgia. You know, the memory making factory feels broken to them. They've been studying for exams that they didn't know until recently would be on, and now they know they're on, they're not quite sure what it will mean. It feels meaningless. It's not hopeless. And if you're a teenager, I want to say it's not hopeless, but it sure does feel meaningless. But Paul said, because Jesus is risen from the dead, the work you do in Jesus' name today, um, the calling a friend in love, Applying yourself to work just in obedience to God because work is good and idleness is bad. Uh, the logging in when you're feeling a little bit off for the sake of visiting with someone you can't visit with. These things, the turning to prayer, the prayer meeting you go to, the youth group you attend, these things are not meaningless. This stuff is so full of meaning because it points to life. It's headed on the trajectory of where all things are actually going, even if for now they've hit a speed hump. These things will have an effect into eternity. He says, you can know because of the resurrection that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You see, meaninglessness might have us for a moment, but Jesus' life overwhelms it. And thirdly and finally, this resurrection victory gives us a victory over lovelessness. Uh, this victory does not take us arrogantly out of life. We don't become tin pot generals as if we're, you know, kind of coated with Teflon and untouchable by the pains of the world. Do you know what Paul encourages the Corinthians do the moment that he finishes talking about resurrection? That the next urgent business on the table, in the very next verse, he tells them to gather their money, get it ready, collect it, because some of it ought to go to their poorer brothers and sisters. Isn't that fascinating that at the news of resurrection, you shouldn't say, so you see you're already halfway to a more spiritual life. But he says, oh, do you see the needs around you? Do you see the needs around you? Well, now without fear, um, now without the need to hang on to everything for yourself as this life was everything, now with a lightness of heart and a generosity of action, you can take what you have and share it with those in greater need. They're headed for eternity too, but they're in trouble now. And I know some of you have sought to do this uh, through me and our church in the last couple of weeks, and it's a real mark of the resurrection. So you see, you can have a victory through the resurrection, not over life, no, a victory into life, but a victory over lovelessness. So as people of the resurrection, as little um, field hospitals of hope, let's go to work. St. John's nurses, doctors and health workers, um, go to work tomorrow. Well, not tomorrow. Go on Tuesday or whenever your shift is. But go in Jesus' name, relieving others' needs. Not um, fearlessly, but they're not overcome with fear. Uh, but bearing Jesus' victory in your heart and speeding your steps. You're doing work not just in the presence of illness and death. You do work in the presence of eternal life. Um, Andy watching this as you um, tune in uh, overseas, having turned the word defence into proactive um, love of others. 
the best thing the Australian Defence Forces do. Uh, what you do this day over there, uh, you do for eternity with eternal goods in mind. And let it be lightened by the knowledge that God is able to take it and, and give it fruit even when it feels vain. Uh, Andrew and Aidan and Narelle and um, Anne and Emily and Jenny and James and to all the managers in our church, the people who've been looking at budget sheets and making hard calls and trying to nurture and hang on to staff. Uh, we want uh, you who are analysts of trouble and managers of risk to, to remember how good it will be uh, when the troubles of this life are overwhelmed by a full, eternal, meaningful, unbreakable life. You're working very hard with others good at heart. Don't be overwhelmed. Be encouraged and keep going. And to Lynette, Grace, Rosie, Judy, all our marginally more elderly friends, brothers and sisters, we want you to be safe and be praising God with us all again here as soon as possible. Uh, we want you to be safe, but we don't want you to be fearful. Your frailty is real. That's why you're at home. But it's just um, a dip in a curve that God is bending unerringly towards eternity and fullness and immortality. And uh, that news is very exciting for us and enables you now, among your friends who are fearful, to be little field hospitals of hope. To you if you're home alone and feeling like you're really missing others, and maybe not just missing others, but might be missing out on life itself, I certainly understand that some are feeling that. I hope it's helpful to remember that the resurrected community of believers will one day be gathered in such a great unity that you will never even forget the moment of lack, even the years of lack. Um, and in the words of another preacher, the best really is still yet to come. And to those of you who've lost work, who've gathered debt, or are furiously managing government packages to see whether things are going to work out for you, if you're feeling the frailty of your flesh, be reminded that you're not forgotten by God. He remembers it too, and he will cover it with life and glory yet. Keep going. So much love we wish to you this Easter. I say we because I don't speak for myself here, but I speak on behalf of you all to each other and on behalf of our church to anyone else who's tuning in. So much love from us as we continue to press on together as Jesus' people in light of a great battle, but certain of an ultimate victory. Little field hospitals running on the power of the real hope of a resurrected Lord Jesus. Happy Easter.
blame. 